Uh, I put two questions, uh, just perhaps uh, uh, Thomas suggested that we should a bit uh, organize uh, the debate in the morning, so that's why I'm trying to do it. Uh, but it's a debate of football. Two questions I put, moral equality, uh, I mean, do you agree with it and does education have to do with, with it? And the second question, uh, how to maintain pluralism, diversity in society? We start with the ladies, ladies first, and Fedba goes through. Um, we go back to undifferentiated <coughs> or uh, Euro-American concepts being uh, peddled as if they are universal. So I'll go to pluralism, but I also want to address your um, comment on Trump. Uh, having lived through elections in the United States. And uh, I don't know if you meant by pluralism just political pluralism, having several parties, or are you also dealing with ethnic pluralism? Because ethnic pluralism, I mean, just uh, pluralism without the resort to violence. For example, in the United States, a party should be able to in speech, defend Al-Qaeda, pluralism such as this. Is it possible? <coughs> well, in the, uh, in the United States, we are talking about a country that spent 200 years developing its democratic institutions. And uh, the success, in fact, of the institutions having a balance between the judiciary, executive, and legislative, this works very well. So I think they can afford to have Trump. Um, comedy or no comedy, joke or no joke, uh, the judiciary can tell him, no, you can't do that on immigration, and it keeps going round and round and so on. Um, but uh, another comment about that is that uh, people who don't agree, the liberals who don't agree with Trump's view, are very upset. Whereas Trump really uncovered the real America. I lived in America 50 years. It uncovered what America is really about. It's not about liberals and uh, socialists here and there and academics. It's about those on motorcycles with tattoos and bandanas and going around exercising power. And they feel that they were left out. The working classes, the, uh, the miners, uh, all these people were left out. And, and uh, uh, Trump uh, uh, told them, um, I'm here for you. And another thing, it uncovered. Uh, a point that was made, I think, in the um, session in the morning about race. Um, the race, the, uh, the comment was, race dis um, disconnected us or divided us. I don't think so. Race is, uh, humankind is one. That is anthropologically, scientifically the case. They all, all humans share the same cognitive structure, okay? But there are different colors of skin <coughs> and other features. How that got translated into inferiority and superiority, that's internally cultural. What Trump uncovered is that many Americans are really deeply racist. I mean, they really don't want the blacks to get opportunity. They don't want to share the opportunities. And he appealed to them. You should have seen the rallies of Trump compared to those of uh, Hillary. Uh, build the wall, build the wall. I mean, it's a, a phenomenon that's scary that people, in fact, have that. So when we, in a liberal format, say race and so on, race uh, doesn't uh, disconnect us. It is racism that disconnects us. I think we should be very aware of the terminology. Racism is an attitude that developed culturally for whatever historical reasons. But race doesn't, shouldn't. Yes. Uh, and, and pluralism, um, if it's ethnic pluralism, I'd like to just point out something I learned right after the Egyptian revolution when I was interviewing people. And he said, I don't know what this pluralism coming from America is about. Pluralism is a numerical concept. That is, there are 50% this, 20% this. He said, Egypt is not pluralistic. It is a fabric. And the notion of fabric comes out of tapestry, 
of several colors. There are Muslims, Christians, Jews, Shias, Sunnis, Bedouins, peasants, and we live together. For some group to come and say, no, you're a takfir, you're, you're an infidel, you're not a real Muslim, or the Copts, we don't like your church, this is not uh, Egyptian. And that's why they rebelled against it. So I think that pluralism as a concept also doesn't reflect certain societies. They don't see themselves as pluralistic, they see themselves as an undivided fabric, a tapestry of colors. And they all work together, the fabric will not be beautiful unless they are all together. We talked about populism and that came up during every session. It came up during your two uh, introductions as well. And when we talk about populism, we talk about something you referred to, Mexicans crossing the border, taking our jobs, uh, African Syrians coming into Europe, taking our jobs. Uh, and that's essentially how we, we usually, this is populism, right? But there's another form of uh, populism, neoliberal populism, and the uh, idea that cutting taxes for the rich and for the corporations is going to create jobs and lift everybody's boats. This is the kind of populism that one American billionaire, Nick Hanauer, uh, well, criticized in one of his TED Talks. And he said, I'm extremely rich, I'm a billionaire, you cut my taxes. The only thing that this will, the only person that this will help, he'll, will help is me. It's not going to create jobs, it's not going to create investment, it's not going to lift anybody else's boat, except make mine bigger. He said that in a TED talk, and TED uh, decided not to put that online on their platform. And that created outrage. So everybody wanted to, to see this TED talk, and so they had to put it back on. And it, uh, why is it that we do not talk about this when we talk about populism? We only talk about those Mexicans uh, stealing jobs and, and that kind of talk is populism, but that kind of talk promoting tax breaks for the rich and the corporations, that's, that's okay. That's, that's actually called something that will fuel progress for everyone. Right. So I think we should talk about both sides. And, and those, those are the kinds of policies that are increasing the inequality that is causing these kinds of, <coughs> of the kind of populism that we talk about. Thank you very much. I have in my Alexander first, and then Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I agree with the, the question raised by Adam. Um, and uh, I'm sure that we will be returning to that many times, and I can promise you that the last day when I will be uh, moderating the panel, I will just focus on that issue. But I now want to come back a little bit to the foundations of democracy that we were uh, uh, discussing. And I've heard of, of the very nice ideas because, you know, all of them, uh, I mean, liberty, fraternity, and uh, equality, and I don't know, uh, separation of power and uh, moral equality, and it looks like more and more as a list of all the good, as opposed to some bad, a list of bad things, which are the opposite. And I would say that it does much, does much, does explain much, as well as you know, uh, explaining the problems of democracy through the postmodernism. We do not know what is postmodernism, we do not know what is democracy, and we're trying to explain one by another. It's a little bit confusing. In my judgment, we have, uh, uh, I'm, I do not insist, but I believe that fundamental value or fundamental structure on which democracy is based is trust in human being. That's the origin of everything. Because it started thousands of years ago. It started in Mesopotamia and Egypt, ancient Egypt. And the idea, it was a religious idea at that time, that since human being is created in the image of God, that means he can differentiate evil and good. And that means that he is, can manage himself. Because, and that comes the trust to the person that he can manage his life. He does not need a king. 
he does not need anybody, and that is the source of democracy. He fact. needs other people. Huh? He needs other people to manage his own life. He, all of them, you know. We all need every, other people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But then we talk about mm -hmm. the uh, 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 mm -hmm. trust. Uh, at the same time, I would say that the other idea, which is also very important in terms of democracy, is unsewing from trust freedom of, of a human being. And that is what is floundering now because of various things. And I'm going to speak at maybe at a later uh, stage about the deficiencies which are rooted more in the the fact that democracy is not exactly what it was supposed to be originally. But anyway, there is no trust, and here, it, and by the way, it's not a deficiency of democracy. It's the fact of which I said, we are going into unknown terrain where the traditional uh, meta narratives do not work anymore. And here, we receive, you know, thousands, you know, I would give you a, 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 a comparison. It's like in the past, a human being was looking through two, three large windows. It was, you know, uh, the books that uh, we've read, it was uh, radio, and it was a discussion with our friends that shaped our vision. And today, we look through thousands of smaller windows of the world, thanks to the uh, social, uh, uh, yes. social media. Social media. Uh, we watch YouTube. Uh, we watch uh, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, and millions of television channels. And everybody can use his own feed that is favored. And that creates total separation of people. We are not connected to each other as we were in the past. And that undermines the trust. Because today if I tell you, OK, I know this guy is a right-wing American, you will tell me, I know his position on climate change. And you will be right. <coughs> And if I tell you that I know the guy in, uh, I don't know, he's a left-wing Brit, you will tell me, I know his position on nuclear power, and you will be right. So our views are pre-shaped by political outlooks, world views that we have created. And that also undermines the trust in, the, uh, in other human beings. I wanted to respond to your statement about uh, sort of more moral aspects of democracy and open society, pluralism, and I completely agree with you, but I think the reason why that has to be like that is not just a moral issue, uh, prescriptive morals has failed to better humanity for millennia, there's there have been prescriptive moralities that haven't really uh, changed us very much. But I think, for me, uh, an open society where there's a free and open debate, where nobody's silenced, where everybody's a participant, and everybody's opinion is valued, it's a matter of rationality. Because if you want to uh, uh, discuss a matter, uh, and, and like we do here, uh, in an open way, and you light it up from many different perspectives, you benefit from that openness. It's a rational process. It's a process of building knowledge. And the other thing is, though, if you have an open debate, that's a great start. Then you have, obviously, differences of interests. People don't just have different ideas, but different interests. And then you have to, you have to have a principle of solidarity. That would be my second foundation. So open, rational debate and solidarity. You can't just leave people behind. Say, well, the majority decides. You know, and the few who, who get left out, whether they are, you know, American factory workers or indigenous people or women or whoever they are, you can't leave people out. You, know, you can't just. There's got to be some 
some some understanding that we our strengths as human beings is to not just share ideas but also to look after each other and to cooperate. That's that's the principle for me. Um, and I guess the, the final thing is that in terms of freedom, I, I, I see it more as a, a matter that of saying, I would put it differently, I would say that people have a right to their private life. If it isn't a matter that touches about uh, on, on common issues, there's no cooperation required. Um, if uh, what I do doesn't impinge on other people's uh, affairs, I should be left to my own devices. So the policy, yeah, the, the, the political sphere shouldn't be overextended. Can you get in your book? Foundations of democracy. Fukuyama has said that there are three things that go together. The nation state, rule of law, and democracy. Not that you can't have one or two without the other, but you can't have a, a found, a solid democracy if you don't have the other two. Uh, if you don't have a stable nation state, uh, it's very difficult to have democratic processes. In times of war, democracy breaks down even in democratic states where you look to the government to be more authoritarian because you give it the power. We saw it in the US uh, in, uh, 15 years ago when we suddenly went to war with Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. Suddenly individual freedoms have to be compressed. It, it happens. Uh, so I think in looking at this generally, when you have a country like Ukraine, which has got occupation and war on its boundaries, uh, it becomes much more difficult to manage a nation state. Uh, rule of law in all its respects, including handling of corruption, uh, we see in South Africa today uh, that the, the absence of rule of law, the way power is exercised outside the law, is a directly a factor that undermines democracy. So I think we have to think of the three of them together. And on the nation state, uh, one of the, 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 the infrastructure of the nation state is a sense of national psychological identity. That the people within the boundaries, whatever their religion, language, uh, national origins, or anything else, they have a common sense of identity. If you don't have that common sense of identity, it's very difficult to buy into. Then democracy may be a process that fragments uh, and polarizes views uh, when different groups are, rather than focusing on their unity, they're focusing on protecting their narrow interests. And I think these ideas help us to look at specific instances and see where something is lacking that may not be democracy per se, but one of the essential conditions for it. And then uh, there's Zachariah's book, which we're going to probably talk about later, tomorrow, on the future of freedom, where he used that phrase 15 years ago about illiberal democracy. The point I wanted to mention was a couple years ago, three years ago, I think it was, uh, uh, Ishmael, our fellow Ishmael Sarah Gelden had a meeting at the uh, Library of Alexandria. I think you were there, right? Uh, on, uh, on democracy. And um, most of the speakers, in, there was Club, of, uh, Club de Madrid, we, was, it was done in partnership with Club de Madrid, and most of the speakers were talking about democracy as an institution, a set of institutions. That was in Baku. That was in Baku, but that, okay, that was in Baku. And um, I think the point that uh, Zachariah made very forcefully in his book was that Democracy, the institutions are the hardware, but the software that makes democracy work are the cultural values. And his point was that the cultural values developed over centuries before the institutions developed. The institutions came out of as an expression of the values, not the values suddenly materializing because you put in place particular, uh, because you put in place particular institutions. 
And we've seen this problem when countries like the US and others have been marketing democracy around the world, mistaking a set of institutions for democracy, and if you simply get the constitution right, or you get the electoral process right, suddenly you're going to create uh, democracy. So in practice, this has really been forgotten. How do you create that cultural foundations for democracy? Uh, that's a really serious question, which we could uh, meaningfully debate. But I have no doubt that putting in place the institutions without that cultural foundation, uh, democracy doesn't work the way we expect it to work. It didn't work the way we thought it might work in Iran after the Islamic revolution there. They ended up uh, electing uh, the clergy and the clergy ended up with, a, we ended up with a, uh, a theocratic state uh, even though it was done democratically. Uh, in India, just to put another view, uh, because democracy, there was the national unity against the British, but uh, democracy, came to a country that was still highly fragmented in terms of its caste system. And an interesting thing happened because when freedom uh, and the electoral uh, system was introduced, and once people believed they really could vote, you had large numbers of people just voting on caste lines. Uh, and uh, so it was no longer <coughs> voting for a set of uh, national policies, it was a set of voting for our community. And uh, one of the ironies in India has been that after independence, corruption kept increasing. And it wasn't quite clear why we had these idealistic freedom fighters and now generation after generation. And one of the things that's uh, not been fully appreciated was you had communities that had been suppressed and left out of uh, power and privilege for centuries, and suddenly they found themselves in an electoral majority, and when they were voted into power, what they were doing was is affirming their right to all the privileges that had previously been <coughs> passed on by the society to other communities. Uh, and in fact, Democracy has been a powerful institution for social integration because you have, a, you have a rising wealth of those who are at the bottom, not through the, the kinds of ways where we think money should be made, but simply through the privileges and powers that government has given to them, and they feel that's legitimate. Uh, and because it's the legitimacy is they want to share in the power. So I'm not trying to pass judgment on this process, uh, the efforts that have been going on in India for th four decades now to try to stamp out the uh, corruption, I felt are very naive because unless you realize there's a process of social integration going on to cancel centuries of discrimination uh, and the, the democratic process is being used inversely <laughs> to serve and uh, to reverse this process. Uh, and everybody hates it, <laughs> it looks so vulgar, but actually it is uh, achieving something like this. Argue about in the same line you uh, sketched now different things. But uh, to make it uh, very clear, I would say that the bashing of Trump, of Putin, of Erdogan, of the Chinese leader is not a very innovative approach because they exist, they have been voted, they act in the next time, <coughs> next 10 years or like this. And uh, this uh, hints to the basic failure of the structures of those economies and societies. So they got their leader from the people, part of people, and if we think about the future democracy, we should not attack those leaders, but look at the people. What is going on in the society? So it is not uh, 
uh, in favor of uh, Trump and so on, but it's the, the question is not uh, clearly posed if you begin with the leaders. You have to begin what happens in the society. And in this respect, I think that uh, beginning with Reagan, Clinton, including Obama, they made a world, not only in the United States, but globally, which doesn't function anymore. And they were drivers, not only the financial markets, but also the policies they made, for example, about the Arabian countries. It was a complete uh, uh, disaster. What uh, I like Obama, but uh, his policy about the Arabian countries has no value at all. No value. And for this reason, we have, at least myself, I have no answer at all how to manage uh, the coming society, as you mentioned, nation states which uh, appeared, at least in Europe, uh, 1648 in, in the Westphalia uh, contract after 30 years of war. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this nation state and the kind of organization as integration and not opening the potentials of the people is now going toward the global area. And, you know, I, I'm just uh, looking a bit at the diversities of the global society or the global economy. It's, it's completely different in Southern Asia, in Africa, and in Europe, in the United States, and so on. <coughs> so, this diversity, how to manage and how the emerging uh, global economy and society will be, I, I don't know at all, but what I know is that we cannot re-establish at the global level with the help of the United Nations a machinery which we have traditionally implemented in the nation states. This, you know, these are just questions and uh, uh, what, uh, what means uh, uh, integration at the global level with uh, combining with freedom and unfolding productivities and cooperation and things we know uh, on what, what, hap what should happen at the global level. It's, it's a cooperation and competition at the same time we do not know, but, you know, I feel a bit bored bashing those leaders in the world uh, and expecting to have a <coughs> idea what the coming uh, global uh, society might be. That's all. Okay. Uh, with the <coughs> richness of this discussion, I hate to add one more element, but forgive me. Uh, uh, I've been giving this some thought. and, and we never discussed the question of the alienation of human groups within democracies. And alienation is a very important issue uh, because it represents a certain disidentification with the dominant institutions of the democratic culture. Then we need to explain away why is it that these segments of the population become alienated and alienated to the point where we look at the 30% of, of Trump he can shoot someone in the middle of uh, New York, doesn't make any difference. He rapes a number of women, doesn't make any difference. And so the question is, why is this group so alienated and so uh, strong in its solidarity of alienation? Uh, now, I, I think there are some explanations for this. I'm not quite sure that they're adequate. But mm, uh, toward the end of the Johnson administration, Johnson came out with the idea of a war on poverty. This was everyone covered. We just want to uplift society. Uh, that was vigorously fought against by the Republicans. Okay, And when they came into power, rather than have some kind of social justice for everyone, they decided to selectively choose racial social justice for the blacks only. 
affirmative action was not a democratic thing, it was the Republican idea. And part of that was if we did this, we would cement the alienation against the blacks. Okay. It, it was really done for rather perverse motives. Um, the, the, at the same time, the US economy evolved into a form of neoliberalism, which meant that the, the middle class remained somewhat static, but the lower middle class had its position threatened. And the most obvious threat that they saw to their position was favoring the blacks, favoring women, favoring immigrants, you see. And, and that stoked up this element of division and alienation, which Trump exploited. Now, why did he exploit it so well? Well, to be frank with you, the man's a master at crudity, okay? In fact, his, uh, his uh, level of elocution mm, is, is uh, far superior. In fact, he makes Hitler look like Shakespeare. No. Um, and the crudeness of his uh, expression mm, is something lower class people identify with. They have a crudeness towards sex, they have a crudeness toward other races and so on, and he has fed and reinforced this element of alienation. And the consequence is that no one can figure out how to budge them. No matter what he does, they remain absolutely steadfast in their alienation from the very middle class structure originated by Roosevelt. Thank you. That's what I have to say. Hi. Alberto. Well, uh, if uh, we want to understand the foundation of democracy, I think uh, among the other things that uh, we need to understand uh, that democracy have emerged uh, as a, a reaction to correct uh, something wrong. Uh, and most of all, basically, to change uh, the vision uh, of human nature and the trust uh, we can, uh, you know, focus uh, on people. People and individual have to be trusted or not. Also, in democracy, one central uh, issue is about uh, mean making. In a theocracy, nobody is allowed uh, to make meaning, not even the king, not even the high priest, because uh, he's only speaking, uh, not in first person, but uh, he's giving voice to God. And uh, God, uh, or Marxist Leninism, uh, or any other theology, in effect, uh, forbids uh, and eliminates uh, any discussion. I'm always right, uh, because God is speaking through me. I'm always right, and you're always wrong, because I'm the right interpreter of Marxist, Marxist Leninism. Fascism is not much better. Uh, fascism forbade in Italy, but so did any Marxist Leninist dictatorship until the Berlin Wall was, uh, you know, kissing up. Even psychology was forbidden. The books of Carl Rogers, uh, with our student from Poland and Hungary, were forbidden. They had to hide it. Why? They was the only official psychology, Pablo. Why? Because psychology is uh, giving the image of human beings and their potentiality. So crucial is uh, how we see human beings and basic as power, in my opinion, longitudinal is trust in human nature and the capacity to become self-aware and self-regulating. Thank you. Michael, uh, I, I confirm psychology in Bucharest University was eliminated. <laughs> psychology also. You don't need psychology or psychology. It's a defect. Thank you. Michael. I'd like to thank the two moderators for their introduction. I'd like to come back to you, Mr. Contest Dinescu, about a couple of things you said, but not now. I want to clarify what you uh, you said, similitude politics and postmodern politics made a distinction there, I believe. And I also wanted to know what you said, uh, what was your model for democracy? 
but that's simply a point of clarification. <clears throat> My main point is to pick up on what Gary said about Fukuyama, three things, nation state, rule of law, and democracy. I'd like to link up the nation state, which I take as a given, as also the rule of law, to link up the nation state with democracy. You said that the nation state exists by reason of a common sense of identity, or words to that effect. Now, the common sense of identity is, I believe, the function of a shared vision. And the shared vision is what we call the will of the people. Now, unfortunately, the will of the people doesn't grow on trees. It can't be plucked on the lowest branch. We constitutionalists have defined the will of the people as an act of purposive collective creation unless and until, uh, sorry, uh, as an act of purposive collective creation unless and until that ongoing articulative act has been accomplished and the process by which it is achieved enshrined in a written and living constitution and perpetuated by constant democratic practice, we risk being left with a political void. So there is the notion that the will of the people is the shared vision of what they should do, and that is something which has to be created. It doesn't, it isn't given to us by history, it's not even given to us by culture, it has to be consciously identified, collectively, and assented to, that is the essence of democracy. Very short, very short. Very, very short. Very, very short. Uh, sorry, national democracy, yes. I just, not international democracy. Roy, I think you just make a short Come comment. To that later. I just wanted to say that Fukuyama was wrong with the end of history. Why we should trust him on this issue? <laughs> I will give you an example. Uh, in ancient Greece, there was no nation state, but there was democracy. No, in Rome, there was a rule of law. Thank you, Alexander. I wholeheartedly agree with you, but I'm going to tell my comment at the end. Fukuyama was dead wrong. During the Iraq war, American journalists uh, uh, questions. Why? Because uh, Iraqi people uh, refuse the model of American democracy. My answer was, the problem is not democracy, the problem is a model. It's a model. The problem is not democracy, the problem is a model. And I talked after this interview. No, secondly, no, 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 I, I secondly. The danger, in my opinion now, the danger for the future of democracy is inside the Western democracy and respecting the poison triangle administration, business, and mass media. This is uh, completely dangerous for, for, uh, for democracy. Yeah. Foundations of democracy. Uh, we are looking at, uh, at, uh, at people, right? But individuals as people. And what makes uh, individual as, individuals as, as people is in fact something that uh, that already was was talked this morning, which is economic autonomy. Mm -hmm. uh, what what do I mean by economic autonomy? Is it's two things basically. It's basic income and basic culture. Uh, basic income uh, and basic culture. Basic income because um, uh, people of slaves can never dream of democracy. So you need to have uh, basic. Um, basic income and, and basic culture that changes with I mean 150 years ago basic culture basic culture was uh, just uh, literacy and uh, a knowledge of traditions right? it was sufficient to um, uh, make uh, uh, a democracy emerge but, but today we know what basic income is necessary I mean if you live below the, the line of poverty you you can never dream of it again. But what is basic culture today is no longer just uh, uh, just uh, literacy and uh, 
and uh, uh, knowledge of traditions, of course. You have also to have uh, digital literacy, a knowledge of history, and a knowledge of science, so that we get that vision, that view of the world, that lets you have uh, um, trust in the, other, in the other human beings, that you understand yourself as part of a species, a biological species, and uh, things like that. So uh, uh, that is, in fact, one of the foundations of democracy for me is, in fact, this notion of basic culture, which uh, connects with what we have said. And uh, that uh, also uh, adds to the, the other two foundations that you pointed at, beginning moral equality and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really sorry to keep uh, so much of your attention, but it's such a provoking speech that uh, I still dare to to speak. Um, I had just one question behind, so I, I could not find the right answer, perhaps not the complete answer, but the question is uh, uh, where democracy is most likely to happen and why, and to succeed. In what, uh, what kind of settings? Uh, and uh, first of all, I think that um, I'm very close to Winston, that is, uh, it starts from individual. Uh, if we do not have uh, the need for freedom, then we could live anywhere and democracy doesn't count to us uh, because we can uh, feel fine in, um, not necessarily fine, but we can accept uh, our situation. Then there is a level of aspirations that is strictly connected with the level of education. So the higher your education is, the more uh, the broader perspectives you perceive, and perhaps uh, you are much more interested in entrepreneurial actions. But uh, you will do nothing without the access uh, to capital, so always you need some opportunity mm -hmm. and some supplies uh, of, of capital, of, of people, of knowledge, of contacts, of partners, and, 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 and so on. And uh, this brings me to the, uh, to the market uh, in India and this uh, spirit of uh, entrepreneurship that, that Gary uh, pointed out, because there was a famous phenomenon like uh, <coughs> called by um, C.K. Prahala, the bottom of the pyramid market. Actually, the bottom of the pyramid market when uh, every citizen lives uh, on uh, $2.5 per day, so it, for us it would be poverty. You could not live for such a money in your country, most probably at least. Uh, and in India, those people uh, had to do that. But uh, how about financing? They did not need too much. So that's why the invention of the Grammy Bank by the Nobel Prize winner was absolutely a, a, a shock for the whole society and a big, big opportunity. Because it's enabled to reduce the poverty through a absolutely extraordinary entrepreneurial spirit of, of the people in India. Siki Prahalat wanted to uh, uh, to build a model uh, of, uh, of business, um, uh, starting from the mo business models of the Western companies, expensive luxury and so on. And to uh, reduce uh, the not so necessary uh, components uh, uh, to be able to offer something to fill this market in cooperation with, with the local companies. But Siki um, Prahalat unfortunately passed away, but he has a successor, this is uh, Stuart Hart, also from University of Michigan, who is working in India only now. Uh, and uh, he's uh, proposing uh, um, a BOP02 model that starts from India, from uh, indigenous spirit, <laughs> and, and totally differently modeling the economic uh, processes and, and, and businesses. And what I have learned from my uh, students from India that this, uh, uh, these uh, models are becoming much more popular uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the fraction of, um, of those uh, small uh, businesses uh, based on poverty uh, are being produced. And uh, so, so this, is, uh, this is something that we really need as a foundation of democracy. And it's not too much. Grammy Bank, Sinaico Finance, Education, uh, spirit, uh, freedom uh, uh, in our thinking. I just wanted to um, suggest another foundation of governance uh, of any kind, including democracy, which is um, national sovereignty uh, and autonomy in, in the sense of the polity 
and the political parties within it being free, completely free, to choose, to freely choose their own agendas from all the way from right to left. And <clears throat> that, that uh, building on what I said in the last session is, is not available under uh, the current globalized free movement of capital where um, whoever is in power in any country effectively has to keep the national economy internationally competitive. And that's why whether we vote Conservative or Labour or you know, Sanders or you know, Clinton or, or, or whoever you, you vote, you, you tend to get pretty much the same policies. Um, another good example was in France when Francois Hollande was elected on a fairly left-wing ticket. It only took about 18 months before he had to swing back to the, the neoliberal orthodoxy. And <clears throat> so we don't really have democracy anymore, we have pseudo-democracy, you know, like Henry Ford, you know, you can have any color car you like so long as it's black. Um, it's, it's the same kind of problem that we have now. You can, you can vote any party you like, but you still get neoliberal policies. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as a result of that, you have voters rebelling by moving to the extreme. <laughs> this explains Brexit, Trump, and so forth. So, um, <laughs> One of those key foundations of governance, the freedom to, 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 for a policy to freely choose its policies, is, is no longer there in any country. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes, please. You go first. You go first. Okay. <coughs> I must admit that I, my, one of my favorite uh, methods when negotiating or discussing or whatever is through kitchen. That's why I, I love Alexander, Alexander Scavel on Fukuyama. Fukuyama is coming to equate in two weeks. For me personally, I do not agree with him on many things. So of course I'm going to use in our discussion, we're going to use our discussion to say, look, you have to be responsible. Like lots of people in Ukraine do respect him and do trust him. It's a matter of trust, of course. But also, one of my favorite books is and Gary, I, I would like to ask your permission. Maybe we can also invite this guy. He's a professor of Stanford University. This a very big book, Intellectual and Society. And he is telling stories of different, you read, right? Different uh, periods of, of humanity for the 20th century. But my, my favorite uh, philosopher, Russell, do you know that he was involved as a very much in supporting Hitler? I mean, not directly, of course, but through uh, his support of uh, pacifism. <coughs> so they played their role. They're very good at all. That's why uh, intellectuals should be also responsible. That's why it should be balanced, not only in terms of judicial or well, all this kind of executive power. If we should also have an open debate where we trust each other, so that we are delivering our beliefs, our values, in a, in a way that we are all looking for some truth. Because the future of democracy is a, you know, something you can't you can know. It's a priority for all of us, I do know it. And uh, I think that, uh, I, I don't know how to feel it very yet. But we should, also, we should also think about balance in a, in ideology, religious, <coughs> in conceptual designs. But I know how to formulate. But I do believe and I do trust and view that intercultural democracy is a crucial and critical thinking is a crucial, crucial <coughs> thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, hello, so I'm a master's student from Delver. My name is Ivan. Uh, I want to. Uh, Saying that it's very important that we think about what does democracy as a notion represent to a uh, basic citizen and uh, to the majority of people who are living under democratic systems. So uh, we can discuss uh, what are the main foundations of democracy, but some things uh, should be noted out and. Uh, of course, it is uh, probably impossible that 
not not it's impossible it will not be good that uh, democracy is notion of the uh, will of everyone um, it's not sustainable but uh, it is important that some things like uh, fair elections like, uh, uh, independent media and other things uh, are uh, are uh, being uh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, one more comment. Mm -hmm. uh, just following on from what you said, um, in the foundations of democracy, there are a lot of important issues have been raised, but I, one I don't think was raised was just the peaceful transition of power between mm -hmm. um, two parties or generally it's two parties. I think your definition of, of pluralism was also included multi-partyism, I assume. But one thing that really worries me is, from what Fadwa and others have said, is the assumption that the people, maybe with Brexit, maybe with Trump and so forth, a majority of the people, or, or substantial enough to win an election, made a bad decision because they were alienated and so on and so forth, but I, I've observed about 35 elections since 1985. And in 1985, you counted ballots, and it was very easy to observe the elections because the ballot papers were there in front of you. But now a lot of the counting is done. You need to be a forensic computer scientist to observe the elections, to observe the count. And so I don't know if, we, if we're paying enough attention to one foundation of democracy, well, at least from, a, from my point of view, uh, not from the more philosophical point of view, is the, the count, the counting of the votes. And I think it was Stalin who said, it's not the people who count, it's who counts the votes. And I think that's the foundation, really, is who are, who are we getting and how are we actually getting those people elected? I'm, I'm not so sure anymore. I think the issue, uh, I think it was Michael who raised it about this shared vision. Uh, uh, democracy seems to work when there is a vision of a future in which everybody can participate. And uh, it doesn't matter how low you are on the poll if you think that there's a way for you to get up. And one of the things that's puzzled me for a long time is, and we see it again, uh, why even the working class in the US votes for, in many cases, Republicans who are okay. leaving everybody to themselves, because there is an aspiration in America to be mm -hmm. on the top, even if you're still on the bottom. And I think one of the things that we see not only in the US today, but in other places is when that shared vision gets cracked, broken, shaken for any reason, as happened in Europe after 2008, especially with the massive immigration, uh, it threatens the whole foundations of the, uh, of the democratic system because there's an assumption that uh, there's a better future waiting for everybody. Could I just add that that shared vision you refer to in Europe was not co-created, it was imposed from above. Uh, we have the neoliberal view is imposed. Uh, just uh, not so many things which will be discussed, but since it's about foundations, I don't know whether democracy took place effectively anywhere in the past or in the world. I would be very really lucky if somebody would show me the direction. But we have some historical foundations of imperfect regime, which would have been said democratic or more tending towards democracy with many exclusions. But one thing is sure, that the basic principle and in fact, it's the first article of the two international covenants on human rights. You see the pacts, the famous pacts, the international treaty ratified by so many states. 
except the, the, the two major states have not ratified rather than them each. It's, a, it's a something. But the first article is about self-determination. It affirms that the first human right is self-determination and national sovereignty, permanent national sovereignty on natural resources. So I, I, of course, I strongly support what John has said to say if you just put off that, you have just a fake democracy. It's an empty democracy without subject. And of course, the famous quote of Lincoln, if you, you see, if you keep it in mind and you check, you see, and uh, of course, you will see that there's no more people, <laughs> no more for the people, no more by the people, and no people at all. So that's, uh, if you, and historically, uh, Athens <coughs> declined because it, it lost the war against Sparta, the famous war, this it was a trap of Thucydides, you see, which is uh, now discussed in all the circles of geopolitics. So this is the key point. When national <coughs> sovereignty disappears or fades away, you have no longer democracy. You have just a fiction of democracy. <coughs> And of course, you see, uh, I'm afraid that we have to face that situation where we can put the question, you see, what is about, you see, the, the strong, the extraordinary strength of globalization, maybe is breaking away very imperfect democracy with all vices that we know very well, that we had, uh, that, we, that had at least a form of national sovereignty, and this national sovereignty, if it collapses, <coughs> is the ruin of democracy. And when they accuse the people of being populist, you must understand maybe they give silly answers to a question, but they give maybe silly answers to a right question, which is the question of national sovereignty. If it is lost, let's forget about democracy. After all, we've seen that in many, in many centuries of history, you have no democracy, or you have, or you have the cycle, you see, of Polybus history. Polybus, by the way, I recall, was the first thinker of globalization. He defined in his history globalization within the context of the Roman Empire, which was certainly partial in the year, but the Roman Empire was thinking itself as orbis uh, terrarum, that is to say, great dominating the world. Yeah, but uh, Polybus was, uh, 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 he was a luxury hostage of, <laughs> at uh, Athens. Greece lost totally the sovereignty and of course the, the vague forms of democracy which were remaining in Athens when Alexander he became not an emperor in Greece, he was an emperor in the Orient, he was a king in Macedonia, in Greece, he was hegemon. Hegemon, it means the leader, the chief, he hegemony. He exerted hegemony. So he said, oh, my dear Greek friends, you, you go on with your constitution, your laws. You see, I will not touch them. I don't touch them. Be, be free. Be free within your cities. But he was the hegemon, that is to say that democracy and national sovereignty were finished. That's all. Thank you. We <laughs> are out of time, but we're going to have last remark from this gentleman, then we go for a break after the end's final concluding remark. Okay, please. I will try to go very short for you. Uh, once again, I want to underline the importance of education. And I'm not just talking about education at the university level, also I'm talking about elementary school, middle school, and so on. My grandmother and my great-grandfather were partisans during the last World War, and they fought against the fascists and the Nazis. They were not communists, they were, were like republicans, which were like kind of left wing, let's say. And they, my grandmother taught me more about history than school did. And I think that we tend to forget how much the other generation, the older generations fought for democracy and for freedom. And this is something that should be taught in schools in the right way. You know, we do not have, we must not forget our history. We must not give for granted democracy. 
I think this is very important. Thank you. And you can be close. Thank you. Uh, if uh, politics is uh, currently defined um, as the art of the possible, the democratization of post-communist Europe uh, could be uh, included in the Havel's notion of the art of the impossible. Uh, the lesson we have learned on the fly in transition from dictatorship regime to democratic regime <coughs> um, specifies that uh, an advanced uh, democratic society should have some essential characteristic such as political uh, complexity and also political inclusion, a functional market economy and also wide dispersion of uh, riches, uh, richness, education, power and authority, a public control upon the political agenda where those affected by the decision to be able to participate uh, in the deliberation about it, mutual <coughs> respect for autonomy and difference, <coughs> a general attachment of the citizens <coughs> for the type of uh, state organization that could support and encourage diversity without any discernment. Of course, this is an uh, ideal uh, picture. The democratic construction is an open process, and the many of the rigid conditions associated with democracy reflect the only failures and resentment of current democracy in a continually changing world. Uh, reverse of culture, uh, <coughs> based of education, culture of democracy, the base of education uh, of young generation is a long, long way to but I conclude with a good uh, news. The political culture knows rapid evolution in moment of trial of the history that may change uh, the destiny uh, of the present world. Thank you all. Uh